On this episode of This Week in Linux, we got a lot of big news to cover, like the release of Linux 5.1, the new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Microsoft announcing the Linux kernel inside of Windows 10, Linux on Chromebooks, and more. We'll also check out some of the latest of news and releases from Ubuntu Touch, the latest GCC compiler, and KDE's new wallpaper competition. That is something I usually wouldn't talk about because those happen quite a bit, but this one's interesting. Then we'll check out some distro news from Ubuntu, Alpine Linux, and Open Indiana. Later in the show, we'll cover some app news for XMPP, PDFs, signage software, and a new app store. Then we'll round out the show with some Linux gaming news. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to talk about Sponses. Sponses is a competitor to Patreon. If you've never heard of Patreon or Sponses, they are crowdfunding platforms that allow you to contribute to creators, um, however, you know, whichever kind of creator you want on a monthly basis for whatever amount that you choose to do so for. And that allows you to that allows the creator like myself to have a consistent amount of money that they can depend on as to devote time to the channel, you know, making it possible to uh, work less on the paying the bills thing, work more on making the content. Uh, so that's why uh, sponsors is a part of this of the Tux Digital um, com, cr uh, crowdfunding campaign sort of thing. And uh, if you would like to contribute to Tux Digital and or to this this podcast, I would very much appreciate it if you go to tuxdigital.com slash sponsus. That's S-P-O-N-S-U-S, -S, sponsor us, combined into one word, so sponsus. Uh, or if you'd like to use Patreon, you can do that as well. Uh, pay, this sponsors is a alternative to Patreon. So if, you, if you're not a fan of Patreon for whatever reason, then sponsus is available to you. And uh, I, I do plan on to make a... A video that explains sponsors more in depth and more direct rather than just in the podcast segment uh, because I wanted to go like much more in depth like why I, you, I created a sponsors account why we're offering both patreon and sponsors and all that kind of stuff so I, I plan on making a separate video for that but in the meantime if you would like to contribute uh, I would very much appreciate it a uh, very very much appreciate it whether you want to do it through PayPal patreon or sponsors all of that would be great uh, so anyway, thank you in advance, and for everybody who is currently a patron, thank you very, very, very much. So uh, let's just get to the show. Uh, first in the show this week is the latest release of the Linux kernel of 5.1. So there's a lot of interesting things in here, but we're, first we're going to talk about a few things, but not everything because there's a ton of it. Uh, but first of all, we're going to talk about the fact that there's a new I.O. interface for input-output interface. There's a, the new support for the AI, the Habana Labs Goya... AI processor, and the I don't know if I said that right, probably not, but they also have new support for uh, ACPI and a lot of hardware updates. They've also done a lot of fixes for Extended 4 and ButterFS. There's a better performance for ZRAM thanks to changing the default compressor, and they have finally enabled the default uh, for Inf Intel Fastboot, uh, even though it's been around for you know a few years trying to you know decide whether or not to put it for default when it was, it was ready or not and uh, this latest version has deemed it ready to be uh, set up by default so this means that the graphics driver feature for eliminating unnecessary mode set operations at boot time for Intel uh, hardware has uh, an option to be able to uh, be by, by enabled by default for Skylake and newer hardware as well as recent Atom software or Atom hardware those um, those on older Intel graphics, though, you can still toggle the feature on and off with the uh, the i915 dot fastboot equal one kernel parameter if you need to have it. But anyway, the fastboot helps provide a clean and flicker free Linux boot experience for those who are using Intel hardware. So that is cool. You can find a link to everything that's in the latest release of 5.1 for the Linux kernel in the show notes below. Up next in the show is RHEL 8 has been released. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8.0 is based on the work for, their, for the Fedora team of Fedora 28. It contains the kernel uh, version of 4.18, and that's the big upgrade to their previously previous version. And this version also comes with an updated GNOME stack with 3.28 and also an, an upgraded, uh, updated systemd. Some other, the other changes and improvements include a firewall interface added to the web console, 
Installing software is ensured by the new version of YUM tool, which is based on the DNF technology. They're actually phasing out YUM uh, completely for DNF in the future, but they're right now they're doing a gradual structure. So like it's kind of like a shim, but not exactly. So eventually the YUM tools will no longer be available, but that will probably be, you know, like 10 years from now. I mean, Fedora is going to do it fairly soon, probably with the next couple releases, but Red Hat not likely to do it anytime soon, but will be. They will be doing it. Uh, this next version, or this current version of Fedora Rail 8, also has uh, an installer support updating for uh, Lux 2 disk encryption. So that's cool. They've added support for uh, system purpose designation to Anaconda, and they've a- introduced this image builder tool that allows users to create customized Rail images. So that they it's available in AppStream, and you can actually to, uh, create your custom, uh, you know, install Rail, set it up how you want to, then create a, an image for Rail from that setup uh, with the image builder tool, so you can deploy it much more easily to like a specifics of what you want. So that is very cool. There's also a lot of cool stuff with the I/O memory management and a bunch of other things. I'm not going to go into like huge depth to it because there's a ton of things that are like server oriented. And um, that might not, I mean, some people would be interested in that, some people will not. But because uh, Rail has such a huge jump from this particular release, I wasn't going to cover it, mainly because we also have uh, covered some of the stuff in Fedora 28 when Fedora 28 came out, uh, you know, back in a couple, like a year ago or so, a year and a half ago or so. So uh, I'm not going to reiterate that. I'll have a link to the episode that has Fedora 28 if you'd like to learn more about that stuff that came in that version. Uh, but also, there, it's worth noting that Cockpit from Fedora is going to be inside of Rail this time, which is very cool because the Rail, uh, the Cockpit management tool for deployment, managing your deployments and your virtualizations is a very, very slick tool. So that's going to be a, a very, you know, beneficial to the people who use Rail and CentOS, I would assume as well. Uh, so, if you'd like to learn more, I have a link to that, the latest release of Rail Red Hat Enterprise Linux, in the show notes. Up next in the show is some interesting news that is theoretically could be good and could be bad. So, yeah, let's just... So, Microsoft has announced that it will now ship a full Linux kernel from within the Windows subsystem for Linux platform, or the WSL. This means that it's no longer just a compatibility layer for, like, running bash tools and that kind of thing. You can now run full Linux command line programs on Windows with a native speed. Well, not native speed, but native-ish speed. You will also have full native Docker container support. So if you were, you know, if you were interested in doing that for some reason, uh, they will also be servicing the 4.9 kernel via Windows Update. So 4.9 is pretty old. Uh, th- anyway, this is in addition to the news that Ubuntu 19.04 is also available on the Windows subsystem for Linux as a desktop image for Hyper-V. Uh, which is interesting because they were typically just doing the LTS. Now they're doing like they're not now they're doing LTS versions and the non-LTS versions going forward in the W in the WSL. Uh, there's also quite a few other things. There's Debian in it. I'm pretty sure Fedora is in it as well. And I know OpenSUSE and even Kali Linux is in a, in WSL. For some reason, this might be beneficial to some. And I, I understand that there are people who use Windows at their work, but they want to use uh, Linux tools, and this makes them able to do that, and that's great. But this is this is a very weird situation because it's it's interesting because it's you know no one expected this to ever happen, uh, no one expected the Linux kernel to ever be shipped inside of Windows, but apparently it has been done. So some people are looking at it as this is a possible good thing, and others are not so much. They are some people are claiming that this is a part of Microsoft's uh, former strategy or you know legacy strategy. Uh, of embrace extend extinguish that is something they've been doing since the you know 80s and um, Microsoft is some, somewhat different these days uh, Satya Nadella being the the CEO of, of Microsoft these days for the past like five years I think he's changed quite a bit I mean ac- actually Microsoft has changed a ton since his uh, tenure as the uh, as the CEO for the company because previously Balmer and Gates hated Linux and hated anything that was open source and, you know, hated the idea of sharing, apparently. So uh, they were doing their best to battle Linux, and they failed miserably on the server and, well, pretty much everywhere except for the desktop. Um, but that's also that's another topic for how that happened. 
uh, Satya Nadella's work this you know past few years is definitely interesting because he does show that he is interested in open source and that he does have at least some you know some interest in Linux and it gives credit to some places where because you know Azure uses Linux. Uh, I'm pretty sure like over 50% of Azure is powered by Linux, so they're aware of it and they know that they can't beat it, so they're just accepting it and embracing the idea that they are going to have to deal with Linux. And in this case, they're putting Linux inside of Windows, even, you know, further making it clear that they are aware that they're not going to, you know, usurp Linux from its position. But it's interesting about the Linux desktop, though, because Windows having Linux tools kind of potentially hurts Linux desktop. Uh, because some people would be using those Linux tools on Linux desktop in order to have the platform that they build for their enterprise stuff. Um, so that has, there's there's some negative aspects to it as well. But I suppose, you know, there's, it was going to happen either way. So, you know, as soon as they realized that it was necessary, there, there's, the community could have helped, they could have not have helped. But either way it would happen. So I guess it doesn't really matter that much as far as, whether or not it would happen, but it definitely think I think that it has potential to be a negative, um, much more so than a positive. But hopefully, I'm wrong. I would like for it to benefit uh, people to the point where they try these tools and they realize, oh, these are, this is a much better system. I'm going to move over. Uh, but I don't think that that's really the end game for this particular thing. Hopefully, I'm wrong though, because I, I would definitely like to be wrong about that. But also, Microsoft in- introduced the Windows Terminal, which is Kind of like a Linux-ish terminal for Windows 10. They finally realized that it was a thing that terminals existed from you know forever, and they finally realized they should have one. So I guess good job on that. I don't know. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this for some particular reason, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Ubuntu Touch OTA 9 has been released. We're going to talk about some OTA 10 stuff too in a little bit, but uh, first of all, OTA 9 has been released recently, uh, this week, in fact. <laughs> anyway, they're focused on the improving its stability for the system, as well as improvements to the artwork. They've done a lot of various bug and performance fixes as well, including some Nexus 5 camera fixes. So if you are a Nexus 5 user and you're having issues with your camera, you might want to check it out. Uh, check, you know, check the latest version to see if those fixes are there. Uh, but for you, because there, there's been there were some issues with people having freezing when they were taking photos, uh, but supposedly that has been fixed. I personally don't have a Nexus 5 for my open to touch phone. I have a OnePlus One, so I I can't I can't test this to verify it. But I think that the uh, you know it's also point out that the OnePlus One is I think is a better phone overall anyway. So if you did want to try a bunch of touch, I would suggest a OnePlus One or the Fairphone to try it out uh, because I think those are better phones than the Nexus 5. However, if you did want to try out multiple systems, the Nexus 5 is supported on a lot of things, so you might want to check that out if you can get it used for a cheap price because mm, it's not a very good phone. Anyway, OTA 10 is also coming pretty soon, and they're going to be introducing 1.1 version of Mir and the latest Unity 8 version to the system. So that's pretty cool. So it's going to be, OTA 10 is going to be a big upgrade to the previous versions. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. Um, also, there is something worth inter- mentioning that's, oh, that's it's a bunch of touch related, but also um, kind of negative, but at the same time is important to talk about because if you look at the Q&A system or Q&A page on uh, the UB Ports website, you'll see that they have a part that talks about the Librem 5 and they kind of, they talk about the, they haven't got any dev kits which is pretty weird because Purism talked about how the Librem 5 would support Ubuntu Touch in the future when it was released, so it's odd that they don't have access to use a dev kit to build Ubuntu Touch for the Librem 5. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to remind Purism to send over that, that dev kit to them so they can get sure to make sure to have it ready to go when the Librem 5 releases. So yeah, Ubuntu Touch is really cool. If you are interested in checking it out, I have a link to it, to OTA uh, blog post in the show notes, as well as a, a link to the Q&A page. So we have some security news th- this week that is technically is a bad thing, but also is not as bad as some people have uh, expressed it to be. And that is Alpine Linux Docker images are having a vulnerability for, um, they contain a null password for the root, root user. 
So uh, CVE 2019-5021 is the designation for this. And uh, versions of Alpine Linux with Docker images since version 3.3 uh, they contain a null password for the root user. And due to the nature of this issue, systems deployed using affected versions of the Alpine Linux container, which utilize Linux PAM or some other mechanisms for like system shadow files as an authenticated authentication database, they may accept a null password for the root user, which is definitely a, a, a potentially a bad thing, but it, it sounds a lot worse than it is. So if you have the shadow package installed, in your Docker container, by the way, this does this only applies to the Docker images of Alpine Linux, not Alpine Linux itself. So if you just install Alpine Linux directly on your system, that's not affected at all. It's just the Docker images. But anyway, if you have installed the, the shadow package on your sys on your Docker container and run your service as non-root user, an attacker could compromise your system via an unrelated security vulnerability, or a user with shell access could elevate privileges to root within that container. There's a lot of different spe specifics that is not as bad as it seems. Uh, one of the things that it is uh, that def makes it like not not really nearly as bad is that there are no SUID binaries at all in the base install of these Docker images. So there's no way of changing the user. You'd have to install something in order to do it. So you're not inf you're not affected unless you have Shadow or the Linux PAM packages installed, which you'd have to manually install yourself. So the config would have to install PAM with SU SUID binaries and configure Shadow passwords and not change the password for those Shadow passwords. Well, this is a you know fairly unlikely situation because if you're going to go through the effort of setting up PAM and setting up the Shadow passwords you would likely change the system password to something that you want personally. Going through all those different hoops to get to this part and not changing the password like that, more that's more like a bad, bad practices, uh, security practices situation. So um, while it's definitely a, an issue and it is a vulnerability, it is not nearly as bad as it seems at, you know, at first glance. So if you are using the Alpine Linux Docker images, but you didn't install shadow packages or the Linux PAM packages, you should be fine, you know, good to go. So anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this particular thing, I'll have a link to the blog post from Alpine Linux as they address this particular issue on their blog. Um, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Ubuntu 19.10, Eon Ermin. I'm not sure if it's Eon or not, but it's definitely Ermin is how you say the name of the animal. And this, this is the latest... Uh, the latest version that's coming out in October 17th for Ubuntu, the 1910. And the code name, as I said, is Eon or Eon something, Ermin. And this is an interesting decision because typically Canonical likes to pick weird different animals, but I think this is a great choice because when they didn't pick the animal I wanted for the queue, I was disappointed. But they redeemed themselves with this choice, and the Ermin is. Uh, and the reason why is because the ermine is adorable. But before I reveal the actual uh, animal in the in the video, which I will be doing, uh, so far 1910 has planned to come with uh, GNOME 3.34 and many additional improvements overall to the system. We don't know fully what's happening because, well, it's pretty new in the development stage. So they're not really going to be giving us much information just of yet. Uh, but they did tell us what it is, what it's what the code name is based on. And the Ermin Weasel is adorable. Up next in the show is the new Linux App Store website. And it's, the Linux App Store is named aptly the linuxappstore.io. And if you uh, want to check it out, it has a lot of um, it's, it's had a lot of cool ideas. And one of the things that I like the most right now is that they're working on the universal formats first. They are also going to be working on adding Deb and RPMs in the future. But right now, they're focusing on the app, the universal formats, because there's a little bit of confusion as to where to find some of them. And it also makes it a lot easier to find. Um, you know, it may run a search to find one of these without having to go to multiple sites to do so. So if you were to go to, you wanted to check out if an app and if a particular application was at a snap, you could go to the Snapcraft store, search there, and then go to the flat pack to see if you can search it and then maybe find an app image for it. But that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, this way you can just go to linuxappstore.io and search for whatever you want. And if it's in the directory, they'll give you a link to the actual website for whatever um, store it's actually in. So 
let's say you look for something and there isn't a snap but there is a flat pack it'll take you to the flat hub uh, website where you can get the, the download information or the install information and the same thing with snap so if the application is a snap it'll take you to the snap store and you can get the information from there so it's very cool especially for the app image thing because there's not really a consolidated structure for where to find app images and this provides a method of doing so uh, there are other people who are kind of working on an app store approach like there's an app image hub there's actually two app image hubs um, that um, one is not that neither one have really promoted that much um, but they, they are both trying to create a consolidated list or whatever but I think this one is a better approach because it allows you to search for app images and all the and both of the other two as well as in the future devs and RPMs so I think this has a lot of potential I actually had an idea to do this a long time ago and never got around to it so I'm glad to see that someone did and thank you very much for doing so so Anyway, if you'd like to check it out, linuxappstore.io. I'll also have a link in the show notes if you'd like as well. The latest version of GCC 9.1, which is the GNU compiler, is out. Uh, this allows developers to improve their uh, binaries and their compilations for their software with this new compiler because there's new language features, there's new optimizations, there's various improvements over the old system as well for performance. And the this release also has some interesting enhancements in the fact that the C++ 17 support is no longer marked as experimental, which is really nice. C++ front end implements the full C++ 17 language uh, which is already available in GCC, but it was experimental, as I said. And uh, the C++ C++ standard library support is almost complete. So they've also got some uh, some support for the draft features from C++ 2A, and they also now have a new front end for the D language, which is cool. So if you're if you develop in Dlang, this would be very helpful to you. Uh, so GCC 9.1 also has some improvements to OpenMP. Uh, 5.0 as well as an almost complete support for OpenACC 2.5. So if you'd like to learn more about the just latest release of GCC, I have a link to it in the show notes. So Google announced some interesting news at their Google I.O. event for this year. And uh, one of the things that they talked about is a new phone, some new services, and all that stuff. But something I thought that was kind of interesting was the fact that they said all future versions of Chromebook systems will have the ability to run Linux applications basically through the Debian container that they announced um, a little while back actually uh, we talked about it on this, uh, this show in a previous episode last year uh, when they announced it at the time it was like somewhere around actually somewhere around this time May June ish is when they announced it uh, so we talked about it then but this is interesting because they're saying they're making a claim that all uh, Chrome OS uh, systems and or all Chromebooks, regardless if they're ARM based or uh, x86 based or whatever, they will all have support for the Linux apps on the Chromebook. So that's pretty cool because we didn't really know if they're going to be able to be pushing on the ARM versions because they were very um, hesitant about that part in the beginning. So that that part is really good if you do have a Chromebook or you plans on getting a Chromebook. Uh, there might be some benefits to having Linux apps for you. And uh, that's pretty cool because it also, if you're not aware, Google has these deals with institutions like schools and um, lots of stuff. So they're kind of re required to get Chromebooks for their schools and like in, of all, all ages, actually. So while I don't like that part, uh, at least it's not Windows devices or Apple devices, I guess. I don't know. Uh, any kind of structure where you are, you insist on a on a school forcing the people uh, their students to get these devices is kind of messed up. So, whatever. But it is cool that now those people can try out Linux apps uh, from those Chromebooks. So at least there's a silver lining there. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more, I have a link to the Android Police web article about this uh, news in the show notes below. Up next in the show. KDE has announced a wallpaper competition for the KDE Plasma 5.16 release. Now, this is interesting, and I, I don't typically talk about competitions for wallpapers because a lot of projects do this, uh, a lot of DEs do this, a lot of uh, distros do it. So I didn't really want to, I don't typically talk about them because it, it, there's not really much to talk about in, the, in most cases. However, there is something interesting about this particular one is that they're offering a prize to the winner of the wallpaper competition. So uh, if you, not only if you win the competition, do you get your background featured inside of the upcoming Plasma 5.16, but you will also be getting a Slimbook 1. 
Uh, rules for this particular competition can be found on the KDE forum, and um, I'll have a, I'll just have a link to that in the show notes. But also, I wanted to talk about the Slim, the Slimbook one is really interesting that they're having this because the Slimbook company ha- donated this uh, a prize to the competition, so uh, that's really cool for them to do that. Uh, so if you're an artist and you want to have your work featured on the KDE desktop, or you want a Slimbook one, then it's time to get creating. And uh, the deadline for submissions is f- May 29th of this year, obviously. <laughs> and uh, it'll be mi- uh, the deadline is at midnight on May 29th. More than likely, they didn't. I didn't, I didn't see the actual time zone, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be UTC because that's how KDE typically, the time zone they, t- they typically use is UTC. So uh, midnight UTC. May 29th is the deadline for this uh, competition to get uh, inside uh, your your get your pl- your background inside the latest release of Plasma 5.16, and also to get your hands on a Slimbook One for free. So there you go. Speaking of KDE, Kaiden or Kaden, I'm not totally sure how to say that one, has now joined the KDE community. So if you haven't heard of it, which until now I hadn't heard of it. Uh, Kaiden or Kaden is a application. It's a uh, Jabber or XMPP uh, chat client application, and it is based on Kiragami and Qt Quick or Qt Quick usage uh, for the the, the toolkit. Uh, and it's designed to support different form factors, including KDE Plasma Mobile. There's also builds for Windows and Mac uh, builds that are coming. They don't. They don't exist right now, but they're coming. They're they're planning to do it because while they join the KDE uh, community, they also get to use the KDE's build infrastructure, which has support for building packages for Windows and Mac OS. And additionally, uh, Kaden or Kaiden now has support for a build for Ubuntu Touch. So if you uh, check out the open store on Ubuntu Touch, you can install and try out uh, Kaiden Kaden yourself. And I have tried it, and it is pretty cool. Uh, you would need a server, uh, a Jabber or XMPP, XMPP server to uh, utilize on this, uh, but it is a pretty cool chat client that I just now heard of this week. So I thought I, thought I knew of all KDE applications or KDE-related applications, but turns out not exactly. So anyway, if you're, if you're interested in checking out uh, Kaiden or Kaden, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is the latest release of Open Indiana 2019.4 or .04 uh, has been announced. Uh, if you're not familiar, Open Indiana is originally was a fork of the Open Solaris project, and it uses the Mate desktop. So uh, this is actually kind of fun because the code name for this particular release is Hipster. We talked about Open Indiana in a previous episode way back in 2017. So if you'd like to check out that episode, I'll have a link to that in show notes. Uh, but uh, this latest version updates Firefox, updates some uh, the latest version of Mate with uh, 1.22. It also adds the VirtualBox packages, including guest editions by default, which is fantastic because I think every single distro should do that because you can have, when you have VirtualBox is open source, if you're not aware, uh, well, mostly open source. There's a little bit that's not, but mostly is. Uh, the, but the, the, having this stuff installed by default makes it much better for the uh, the experience of using any of these distros inside of a virtual machine, uh, in VirtualBox specifically, of course, so that you ought, you don't have to install the system, cre- create a VM, install the system, and then install all the stuff to make it work right in the virtual machine. Whereas if you do, well, you, well, having it included well, allows you to just install the system to the virtual machine, and then everything's good to go. That's very cool. And they also did some improvements to their Open Indiana specific applications because they've they've ported it from Python using type Python 2.7 and GTA 2 to Python 3.5 and GTA 3, which is great to see because uh, those things are deprecated. So it's very important that they you know soon as possible transition to the newer toolkits. So that's great to see. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about Open Indiana, I'll have a link to this latest release for the blog post of 2019.04 in the show notes. Up next in the show is the latest release of 1.2.0 of PDF Arranger. If you've not heard of it, it is, PDF Arranger is actually a small Python GTK application which uses an, uh, intergra- an interactive graphical interface allowing you to easily manage PDF files and manipulate them as you, ca- as you, ne- as you need to. 
it allows you to uh, merge, split, rotate, crop, and rearrange pages inside of PDF files because you know that can be a big pain in, in Linux or actually in general. So um, like th this is really nice to have because it makes it a lot easier to deal with that kind of thing. Um, it also is worth noting that they've added some new shortcut keys to make it easier to use. And if you are not aware, there was a previous version of this that this was forked from called PDF Shuffler. But PDF Shuffler was, you know, deprecated many years ago. So I'm happy to see that uh, PDF Arranger has taken the reins of that application to create a new one because it is a very, very important thing. When you do any kind of business or work of any kind that requires documents, you have to deal with PDFs and, you know, taking certain pages out, modifying those pages and putting them back in and merging it all together and all that stuff. It's really annoying. So this is really great to have, and uh, thank you for making this particular application because it makes a lot of like makes a really annoying thing much easier. So yeah, if you'd like to learn more about PDF Arranger 1.2.0, I have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is the 1.0.0 release of Libra Signage. Uh, it's an open source digital signage software, and in this is uh, a, basically it's a self hosted digital signage software that it allows you to. Uh, implement something like if you wanted to do a menu at a restaurant or something like that where you can uh, have a sign that's on a TV that would automatically rotate at specific intervals and load different things. It could be video or images or whatever. Um, and uh, this latest version adds some extra features like being able to mute uh, the videos by default. So instead of having just the videos automatically play, you could have it play, have video with audio, but by default having the mute option on. That's pretty cool. They also added functionality for building Libra signage Docker images, as well as some modularization for their build system. And this release also featured a lot of bug improvements and other enhancements. So if you have uh, ever had any interest in checking out uh, a digital signage solution, you could check out Libra signage for that if you'd like. There's also other ones like, uh, there's actually quite a few, but I think Screenly and Libra signage are the ones that you should check out. So I have a link to the actually both of those in the show notes if you're interested. So yeah, Libra signage 1.0.0. Up next in the show is the first of three Linux gaming news. And first up, we're going to have D9VK 0.10 has been released. D9VK is a project based on DXVK and provides Direct3D 9 to Vulkan translation layers. Now, this is actually, the reason I want to bring it up is because this is we talked about this previously, but this is the first release or like inaugural release of D9VK. So that is great to see because it's only been like maybe two months since we talked about it, I think. So uh, that's very cool that they're working so fast to get something like that because having support for DX, uh, you know, DX9 or any of these versions makes it a lot easier for Proton and things like that to work much smoother. So that's awesome. And this, so this, the D Direct 3D9 is for like older games that people still want to use and having support for that allows you to translate them to Vulkan so that they run on Linux. Very cool. This kind of this these games would be like uh, Guild Wars 2, Tw G Guild Wars 2, uh, GTA games, and other popular titles. Uh, some of these games will work with the existing Wine D3D code, but this actually should improve the performance and uh, provide other options for players, like say for example using Proton. So if you want to check it out, I'll have a link to it in the show notes for like their changelog and all the stuff that they talked about in their uh, their release notes for get the GitHub page. So I'll have a link to all that in the show notes for D9VK 0.10. So earlier this week, GamingOnLinux.com did an article about the easy anti-cheat uh, system being paused for development for Linux based on the uh, comments from someone, uh, one of the partners and there's that they made um, you know prior to the statement of the article and then they then they talked to epic games and got a response to them or uh, talked to easy anti-cheat and got a response and to say that that's uh it's not exactly what is being stated by that developer so uh the gaming on linux also issued a retraction saying that it's that statement was not fault was not true um however i would like to point out that the response that easy anti-cheat gave not the best response. It doesn't really make me feel calm about it or, you know, whatever. They're saying that the, the an easy anti-cheat is still going to support Linux. It's just not always a priority. It's never a priority. It's Epic Games. 
So they're not they're not stopping the development of the tool for Linux, but well, I'll just I'll just say what the, the tweet said. To clarify, Easy Anti Cheat still provides native Linux support and will continue to do so. Earlier comments by a partner reflect ordinary day-to-day -day prioritization decisions on anti-cheat issues across all platforms and not any change in long-term priority for Linux. That's supposed to make it make us feel comfortable and sound like they're not abandoning Linux or whatever. However, it doesn't. It's just marketing speak. It's just trying to, you know, double talk, say that, hey, we're not actually block ending development. We're just going to put it to the point of like, eventually we'll care, but we're not going to care right now. Because it says, you know, we're, this is reflect our ordinary day to day prioritization, meaning that the developer saw the prioritization for day to day, that they're not going to be working on it, and that they're going to pause their development for it, which is what the guy said which is more than likely true based on how Epic Games works. They just pretend to care, but don't actually care. And uh, then they said, well, it's not going to change any of our long-term priority for Linux. Okay, we know that because you don't really have long-term priority for Linux. You have the eventuality of doing support for Linux. And that's really all you're saying. So, yeah, I think Easy Anti-Cheat System is important because it's used by so many games and it's unfortunate that epic games purchase them because they're just going to ruin it like everything they else everything else they touch other than fortnite somehow they were able to make fortnite work uh well actually because it's free to play so that's that's how they made it work and for some reason people want to pay two dollars for dancing things i don't know but apparently they do so um fortnite made epic games this big juggernaut in the industry and now Epic Games thinks that they're like the savior of the industry, but really they're the ones hurting it because they talked about how cross-platform is super important and then they announce that they're going to have exclusives on the same platform that the games already existed on. They were already making games for Steam and now they're not allowed to have Steam games because they're having exclusives on Epic Game Store. It's just a huge mess, and the the people who run Epic Games they don't even apparently like notice the obvious contradictions that they have, or don't care. I mean, they, more than likely they don't care, just like they don't care about Linux. So, I think they have deprioritized Linux for sure, but not any more so than they already had. So it's not that much of a change. It's just you know just another day for epic games so let's not end the show with a negative topic instead let's talk about another topic that is a competitor to easy anti-cheat and that's actually doing something good and that good news is battle Eye is working with valve for support with steam play so this news is actually really awesome because this is, I mean, hopefully it happens soon, but essentially what it's going to allow you to do is to play games that use the BattleEye anti-cheat software tools uh, to able to use those games and play them in Steam Play via Proton. This is games like PUBG or Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and many other things are using BattleEye to accomplish this process. So this is very cool because it makes it possible to uh, potentially play a lot of games that weren't weren't uh, able to before because of these limitations of this anti-cheat. Uh, and it's also great because um, it's a competitor to easy anti-cheat, so it might make them wake up and stop being awful and pretending that they care when they really don't. So, yeah, hopefully it's a double-sided uh, benefit of having both uh, support for those games that use BattleEye and the convincing Epic Games to stop being terrible. Or stop being as bad as Epic Games usually is. So, yeah. So, you know, we're going to end that on a good note. That BattleEye is working with Valve to support Steam Play. And I can't wait. I have a link to the this article and well as the other article for Gaming on Linux in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute. You can contribute via PayPal, Patreon, Sponsors, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe.
And we also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links to places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. If you'd like to submit some good news to the show, then visit the subreddit by going to thisweekinlinux.reddit.com. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. And just a reminder, this show is live usually every Saturday, but apparently for the past month, once this month, okay, so anyway, it will be live this next Saturday, this coming Saturday, so be sure to join us in the live chat room to discuss late, all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanoa with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.